Today we're talking about America's greatest motorcycle brand, Indian Motorcycle. Indian is America's first born, the original American cruiser, pioneers in the early years of motorcycling. They're responsible for one of the world's greatest motorcycle rallies, and they made a name for themselves by making cruisers that are powerful, stylish, comfortable, torquey, good at handling, and smooth. They've fallen down and gotten up more times than we can even count. This one's gonna be a wild one. Let's take a road trip on the history of Indian motorcycles. The story of Indian motorcycles began with George Hendy. George was really into bikes, like really, really into bikes. He liked to race them, he liked to build them, he liked to organize big old racing events. He slept with a can of WD-40 and a picture of Lance Armstrong. Anything you needed to know about cycling, George was your guy. He was America's cycling champion. And best of all, he ran a bicycle making company in Watertown, Massachusetts. The Hendy Manufacturing Company. This company would end up becoming the great Indian motorcycle brand we all know and love. One day, George woke up and he wasn't into <laughs> bikes anymore. They just weren't hitting the spot. He had run out of races to win and his company had run out of bikes to invent. He also started acting a little differently. Like he started wearing more bandanas than usual. He started rocking a horseshoe stash and he would cut the sleeves off his denim. Who is this guy? When George attended cycling events, there was one thing there that would never fail to steal his attention. And that thing was pacers. Pacers were motorized bicycles. Pacers split the wind in half for cyclists. I don't know if it was the puttering of the engine. I don't know if it was a sweet smell of gasoline making George feel a little woozy, but he really liked these things. He decided he was going to build one of his own, but there was one problem. He didn't have the faintest clue how to build these things. So he hired someone who did, Oscar Hedstrom. Oscar was a Swedish man with an obsession with pro cycling, a history of building his own engines and a briefcase full of prototypes and unrealized potential. Together, George and Oscar would build a motorized bicycle like no other. In Springfield, Massachusetts, these two men put together this machine. It was a single cylinder, diamond frame, chain driven motorized bicycle with 1.75 brake horsepower. They called it the Indian. To George and Oscar, this was just another motorized bicycle. But to the world, it was the beginning of one of America's greatest motorcycle manufacturers. And a bicycle that sort of kind of looked like a camel because it had a big hump in the back to store the gasoline and the oil. They nicknamed it the Camelback. Oscar, being the racing enthusiast that he is, put his bike to the test. He started setting world records. He won an endurance race from New York City to Springfield, Massachusetts. But George Holden and Louis Mueller from the dealership across the country weren't convinced they would ride their Indians from San Francisco all the way to New York City until it broke down. They rode and they rode and the motorcycles never broke. Down. 31 whole days without a single mechanical problem. Now that's impressive. The Indian was hot and a hot bike needs a hot color. So the Hindi manufacturing company introduced the famous Indian red in 1904. Oscar had made his dreams come true and George got his adrenaline pumping again. He was addicted to gasoline and watching his bicycle zip around the racetrack. George and Oscar were pioneers in the early years of the motorcycle industry. They built America's first V-twin production motorcycle. They took their 633cc Indian race bike and made it for the road. Now it was a two cylinder with four horsepower. If you want it to be cute and all, you can get like a tandem attachment where you know you get two seats and you can go on a cute little date. They thought of everything. Indians had become one of America's favorite bikes. They were being used to dominate the Isle of Man TT cannonball across America and then cannonballing again across North America. In 1916, the company got even more innovative. They developed their own motor, the Power Plus engine. They squeezed a thousand cc's of pure American muscle into an elegant cradle spring frame. Called it Power Plus because its output of 16 horsepower was enough to make you poop yourself. They expanded their lineups by offering lightweight motorcycles like the Model O, an entry level flat twin ride for young and thrifty riders. Indian was winning races, they were winning customers, and they were winning the interest of super duper rich investors. All was going well until one day they started losing. Not races, not money, but people. One gloomy day in 1913, there was a big fight at the headquarters. A Swedish man was going off the rails yelling, getting all angry. It was Oscar and he was pissed. Oscar wanted to create great American bikes, not write off company assets and artificially increase their stock value. What was this? 
business school? Oscar left the company and he was replaced by his assistant, Charles Hustafan. Shortly after that, George left too. He wanted to breed cattle and chickens on a farm. So he did. And shortly after that, the American troops left. America was at war. And the people at the Hendy Manufacturing Company were not prepared for a catastrophe of this magnitude. The Hendy Manufacturing Company dedicated their entire production capacity to supporting the US military, selling a whopping 50,000 of their Indian Power Plus models to the US military. The military was getting all these bikes, but Indian fans across the country didn't have any Indians to buy. They wanted to rev engines, race bikes, and meet up at local coffee shops. So this lack of supply provided an opportunity for another American brand to steal the show, Harley Davidson. Harley Davidson gave these hungry customers exactly what they wanted. And when the war was done, the Hendy Manufacturing Company was crushed. They had just dedicated their entire lives to the war effort. And what they get in return? a demotion from the number one spot to number two. They relied too much on government contracts to pay the bills. And Harley was taunting them now. They were sticking out their tongue, making L's on their forehead. Indian needed to get some payback. They wanted to reclaim their position as the number one American motorcycle manufacturer. But it was a problem. Their bikes were getting kind of old, outdated, boring. Their power plus performance wasn't anything to get excited over. The looks, they were dull and uninspired. They needed someone, someone with um, engineering know-how and design skills to give the Indian a complete makeover. That person was Charles B. Franklin. Charles took a look at the Indian bikes and went, what the heck is this piece of junk? These motorcycles need to be smaller, sturdier, and lighter. The engine's fine, but it just needs to be a little bit more compact. Let's wrap it up in aluminum. And we're not going to make it chain driven like all these other bikes in the market. We're going to make this motorcycle gear drift. The helical gears will join the transmission and the engine directly. Sure, it's expensive, but it's going to be a lot more durable. And that's what we're all about. And while we're at it, no more of that flat frame heavy single down tube bullshit. Let's add a double down tube frame chassis. Not only will it be more sturdy, but it will also be surprisingly lighter. Indian responded to Harley Davidson with a whole new lineup of motorcycles, two of which would become the most iconic and best selling Indian models of all time. The Scouts and the Chief. The Scout is Indian's most important motorcycle. It's often regarded as the entry level cruiser in the lineup. But don't let the words cruiser or entry level confuse you. It began its legacy in the early 1920s as a sloppy, wet, noisy bike with 610 cc's and no front brakes. Its size increased to 745 cc's in 1927 with the Scout 45. It gradually became a crowd's favorite. People called it every man's motorcycle because it was for everybody. Old riders, new riders, men, women, vegans. The Scout was Indian's baby and they nurtured and cared for it year after year. The Scout 101 had a lower seat, a longer wheelbase, better handling, and a near perfect 50-50 weight distribution, which made it a really good bike for insane stunts. The Chief, on the other hand, introduced in 1922, is the Scout's cozier, more premium cousin. If the Scout is economy, the Chief is business. It's for people looking for something with a little bit more power, a little more taste. But the Chief was more than just big. It had flavor. It was a bike that put skirted forks on the map. By the 30s, the Hendy Manufacturing Company was vibing. They had a new company name, the Indian Motorcycle Company. They left out the R because they make bikes, not books. They had entered a growth phase in the company and they got a little bit confident. They acquired Ace Motors, which resulted in the Indian Ace, an elegant, charismatic four cylinder that would become a staple in the company's lineup. They designed bikes for the police. They also offered their bikes in 23 different colors, thanks to their merger with DuPont Motors. If you were indecisive before, how about now? Indian sales had recovered. Their bikes were back on the road again, but people were also taking their bikes and turning them into these very impressive hill climbers. In the 30s, they introduced sort of upside down engine design, they wanted to improve airflow. Instead of having the intakes on top, they had them at the bottom. And instead of having the exhaust down below, they had it on top. This innovative engine sucked. It was completely impractical and nobody liked it. Now here's the cold hard truth. Things weren't all sunshine and rainbows. This was the 30s. People were jobless. They were broke. They were hungry. You'd have to be a lunatic to spend your dollar bills on a motorcycle. The Great Depression was in full effect. Indian, being the company that it was, didn't give a flying damn. They kept on releasing new models like the Scout Sport, the Motoplane, the Scout Junior. The standard Scout had a little bit of extra weight. We don't talk about the standard Scout. Even when people weren't interested in motorcycles, they found ways 
to stay relevant. They manufactured aircraft engines, boat motors, air conditioners. Indian riders were taking their bikes to races, like the Daytona 200, and they were stealing the show. Indian riders were heading down to South Dakota, meeting up, and planting the seeds for what would eventually become Sturgis Motorcycle Rally. Things were tough, but Indian was making it work, and absolutely nothing could get in their way. Nothing at all. Okay, maybe like a war, but like, what are the chances of that happening again? Here's the thing about Indian, they take war very seriously. I get it, they have a history of building solid bikes and being American is a huge part of their identity. And if they let Germany win, that would mean that the Boxer was a better engine than the V-Twin. They're not gonna let that happen. They sold bikes to the French. Wee wee wee, merci. They designed bikes for the US Army. They delivered $24 million worth of motorcycles and spare parts. That's like 24,000 Bitcoin. The US and Germany were planning to fight in the deserts of North Africa. Germany already had their BMW R71 flat twin Boxer engine. The United States, had the Indian 841 and a Harley. But we won't talk about the Harley in this video, we'll save it for another one. The 841 was a V-twin, but the cylinders were set to 90 degrees. This engine design would become quite popular in Moto Guzzi, but Indian did it first. It was shaft driven, it had hydraulic forks, rubber mounted handlebars. It was a bike built to handle some serious off-roading. Through a North African desert, World War II had many casualties, one of which was our beloved Indian chief. Again, Indian had fought for American freedom. In return, they got crippling financial debt. The company was running out of money and it was in complete disarray. They had no idea what to do. They brought in new management, Ralph B. Rogers. They sold scooters that folded in half. In the late 1940s, Indian made a crazy decision. They introduced a new lightweight motorcycle called the Indian Silver Arrow. It was a single cylinder and it had 218 cc's. This bike was detrimental to Indian and some people argue that it's the bike that killed Indian. It was expensive to make, it was poorly built, and people weren't ready to give up their V-twins. In 1953, just as the Indian Motorcycle Wrecking Crew had claimed its third consecutive win in flat track racing, Indian seized operations and discontinued production of all of its motorcycles. And that's the end of the Indian Motorcycle Company. Except it wasn't. Indian motorcycles may have been discontinued, but the Indian name? lived on. Allow me to introduce you to the most heartbreaking time in Indian's history. After the company went belly up, John Brockhouse, the CEO at the time, kept the Indian brand alive by slapping its logo on AGS's, Norton's, Vincent's, and more commonly, Royal Enfields. And while the company may have been frowned upon for engaging in such activities, Indian may not have been alive if it wasn't for this. For the next little while, the Indian name got passed around like a hot potato. AMC had it, and as you know, anything AMC touches goes up in flames. Lloyd Clymer, a magazine publisher and former Indian motorcycle salesperson, also had the name. He sold mini bikes with it, and then tried to make a motorcycle called the Veno 500. It had an English motor, an Italian frame, and American branding. But shortly after that, Floyd passed away. Indian was passed on to Alan Newman, a lawyer, because at that point, anybody could own the Indian brand. He made a prototype for a new bike using a Ducati engine. But then he ran out of money. Indian was passed on to DMCA. They sold go-karts, it's interesting. And then the Indian name just stopped showing up. The rights to it were being fought over in courts for years and years. And then eventually the name popped up again. Two Toronto businessmen ended up acquiring the rights to the Indian trademark. They formed a new Indian motorcycle company, this time with the R. They had reintroduced the OG bikes, but they had added a motorcycle that we've never heard of before, the Indian Spirit. So the Spirit sat in the middle of Indian's lineup. Turns out the company wasn't doing so hot. They sourced all their engine bits from this company, which essentially made replacement parts for Harley Davidson. You could argue that the new Indians were kind of ripping off Harley. Anyway, long story short, in 2003, they went bankrupt again for the millionth time. At this point, I understand if you've lost faith in Indian motorcycles. I understand if you feel that the company is cursed. And I would agree with you if this didn't happen in 2011. A new Indian company formed again in 2006. They were selling these chief models as exclusives. And you know, they were just barely keeping the company alive. 2011, something happened. Something that saved Indian from becoming history. Polaris Industries entered Indian's life. Polaris was this ultra successful off-road and leisure vehicle maker and the ex-papa of Victory Motorcycles. In an incredible act of sacrifice, they orphaned Victory Motorcycles to give life to Indian Motorcycles. They gave Indian the refresh and the makeover it needed. They finally developed a new engine, the Multi-directional fins, 
parallel push rod tube. It had all the innovations with the old school Indian charm. They hiked the brand back to health. They brought back the old classics, you know, the Scout, the Chiefs, but they also introduced a whole bunch of new bikes. The FTR, the Challenger. They carved a place for themselves as a company that makes cruisers that are comfortable but powerful. They handle good and they're premium. They did this in a market that felt untappable. They persevered. For the first time in a long time, one of America's greatest motorcycle brands is back. And it looks like they might be here to stay.